Hi, my name is Alexa Griffith. Yes, my name really is Alexa, but hopefully I won't echo today. And I'm presenting with my amazing tech lead, Mike Hurwitz, who we call Danger. We're both software engineers on the data science infrastructure team at Blue Core. And today we're gonna to talk about how we use Google Cloud to serve tens of thousands of personalized recommendations per second. At Blue Core, we have a saying, as simple as possible, as powerful as necessary. This is one of our company values, and we will keep this in mind as we discuss the evolution of building our robust recommendation service throughout this talk. So GCP has enabled us to build a service that has this value of being as simple as possible and as powerful as necessary. In building the recommendation service, we were able to leverage the wide variety of GCP tools to store, query, and serve data. They all see some purpose, but really it's the breadth of their offerings that make services like ours possible while allowing us to maintain a low operational overhead. So you might be wondering, what is BlueCore? BlueCore offers intelligent e-commerce marketing as a service. We send you the marketing emails that don't suck, and we aim to send you better emails, not more. We're a company that's around seven years old. We have around 250 employees. We serve hundreds of large retailers, including some you may have heard of like Nike and Sephora. What makes us different is that we don't send the same email to every person. Almost all of our millions of emails that we send every day are personalized. Additionally, we've started providing real-time recommendations on retailers' websites, and we're gonna to refer to this as our on-site product. So let's discuss. What even is a recommendation? Well, when we talk about a recommendation, we're talking about products that we think someone will like based on either a product they've interacted with or they may have a preference for given their purchase and viewing history in the past. Essentially, we map either an email or a product ID to a list of recommended products. For example, in these cases, two recipients of the same campaign, which is just a type of email send, left different items in their carts. And we call these abandoned cart emails. If we take a look at the email on the left, the person's left jeans in their cart. It's possible that based on their past purchasing and viewing history, we want to recommend to them a cami or a t-shirt. On the other hand, the, in the right email, a person has left a collared shirt in their cart. We may recommend other products similar to the collared shirt as products the user may also like. For example, here, we recommend other types of collared shirts. But there's some things to consider. It's not just as easy as putting some pictures in an email and sending the email. There are certain things we need to take into account like product exclusion rules, which are evaluated at runtime. What a product exclusion rule could look like is you say in the email, you don't want to show a product that's on discount or out of stock, or maybe even you wanna show a product that's recently come back into stock. Since products update constantly, it's very important that we have an accurate catalog and don't show invalid products in the email. This requirement definitely makes our service a bit more interesting, and we'll talk about how we use our product update listener to keep our product catalog fresh. So marketers decided to send an email, and they create a campaign. A campaign has an audience and a template. A template has blocks which may contain recommended products. The template is mixed with the audience query that runs in BigQuery, and with those we can generate the emails. Products are then joined with the audience in the query, which means that any decisions the template makes cannot rely on anything that the query is unaware of. Generating audiences this way is very flexible and we consider it to be a competitive advantage, but applying recommendations at this stage is very limiting. So you may be asking, is this good enough? Onsite was a new frontier for BlueCore that forced us to reevaluate our architecture. Latency became a primary driver, not just bandwidth. Audience generation and personalization are separate, which means the templates are limited to data appended to the rows of the audience query. We want to support templates that are structurally dynamic rather than just filling in blocks, and that means either making the audience query aware of all of the decisions that need to be made, which is pretty difficult, or allowing the template to pull the recommendations it knows it needs at runtime on a per email basis. A-B testing is another example of a personalized runtime decision that's difficult to make in the database. Previously, we were copying some recommendations into Data Store to support these use cases. And while Data Store is great, this is really not what it was made for, and it got to be very expensive. So we had to build something new. Pages on the web start to feel slow at three to 400 milliseconds and recommendations is only part of the on-site campaign process. There's also generating the template and transiting all that data to and from the browser. 
So we gave ourselves about 100 milliseconds to do all the work that we needed to do on the recommendation side. We want to be able to serve about 50 million emails an hour. And if you do a little math, that works out to 13,000 emails a second. We targeted 20,000 emails a second because we figured that would be enough headroom. Doing product filtering in the email means that there must be enough products returned that the filters will be run across all of them and there'll still be enough to fill in the blocks. That means sending more products than are actually required down into the templating engine. We wanted to move those decisions up into the recommendation service so that we were only returning the products that we needed rather than returning too many, or potentially, even worse, too few. Supporting recommendations via A-B tests is vital because, frankly, without testing, you can't improve. And we want to do all of this without spending all of our money. So for the naive implementation, we want to change as little as possible. We know this probably won't be good enough in the end, but what it will do is it will give us a good idea of what areas we need to improve on. So if we want to change as little as possible, how would we do it? Well, we would choose to write a gRPC service to communicate with our templating engine, and we want to go ahead and make use of the data that we already have available. Our recommendations data already lives in BigQuery, along with our products data that comes from data store. So this would be the minimum we need for our service to do runtime personalization. The recommendation service makes up one of three parts of personalization, with the other two being templating, which comes from data store, and the audience, which is just all the people that receive an email and is stored in BigQuery. The recommendation service runs in Kubernetes engine and is written in Go, and the products data lives in data store, while the recommendations live mainly in BigQuery with some copied into data store. So now we've checked the as simple as possible box, but do we meet the as powerful as necessary requirements? Well, when considering if our service meets these requirements, we're going to evaluate the recommendations and products components. Remember, we now have to consider on-site or the recommendation on the company's website as part of the requirements. BigQuery is great for bandwidth, but now latency is our problem. We're failing to meet our on-site latency requirements. Even if we did export all of our recommendations from BigQuery to Data Store, we still might not hit our latency goals. And keep in mind, for us, using Data Store is expensive here. But we can't blame a hammer for being a bad screwdriver. We just need the right tools. So first, we're going to discuss how we can liberate our recommendations. As I just mentioned, BigQuery cannot be the source of recommendations at runtime. The latency is just too high. So we looked into Bigtable instead. Why Bigtable, you may be asking? Well, caching is not a good option for us because the specific recommendation data for a given recommendation type, email, and namespace are often only read once before they're invalidated in the cache. And a cache miss would mean reading directly from BigQuery, which costs us in latency, or data store, which is expensive. On the other hand, Bigtable latency is around 15 to 20 milliseconds and better the harder you hit it. So if we consolidate our data into Bigtable, we can meet our latencies requirements. Our recommendations, including events and our generated recommendations from our data science models are still stored in BigQuery. Additionally, we started generating some of our recommendations using Dataproc, and these are stored in GCS. We created a service written in Go that's a Kubernetes task running in Airflow just to migrate and consolidate our recommendations data into Bigtable. The GCS and BigQuery API, storage API, made loading data into Bigtable fairly easy. With a small Bigtable cluster of just three of three nodes, we're able to load, read, and write 150 to 200,000 rows per second. So now that we have our data into Bigtable, let's talk a little bit about how we deal with our data in Bigtable. We have hundreds of namespaces, but Bigtable has a thousand table quota. We can't have a per namespace table for each of our recommendation models, or we're going to quickly reach that 1,000 table quota limit. That's OK, though. They don't call it medium table for a reason. This is what Bigtable was made for. So instead, we have a per table, we have a table per recommendation model, and our schema is the key as the partner and ID, which ID could be like email, and the value is a list of product IDs. So just to recap, this is what we had before, paying attention to the recommendations coming from BigQuery and Data Store, which are now consolidated into Bigtable via, via our BigQuery to Bigtable service. And we picked up literally seconds of latency. So now that we've improved the recommendation component of the service, are we good now? Are we meeting our on-site latency requirements? Well, I mentioned previously on the previous slide, 
that there are two areas where we can improve our recommendation service, the recommendations portion and the products. Now that we've improved recommendations, we're still constantly fetching products from the data store, causing it to burn a hole in our wallets. Additionally, we're failing the on-site latency requirements because of this too. So we measured data store latency from a GKE application written in Python, and each of the products we fetch from data store are around two kilobytes per entity. We found that the data store latencies aren't great. They're about 45 milliseconds to get started and then an additional 4.2 milliseconds per key. So like I said, not great, but they aren't totally disqualifying for our use of data store. Using data store didn't leave us a lot of headroom. So if data store isn't gonna get us where we need to go, we need to find something else. What we need is a latency smackdown. Our objects are about two kilobytes. And so these are cacheable. We found memory store to be about two orders of magnitude faster than data store. Fetching a single key out of data store cost about 50 milliseconds, but memory store for the same load cost only 125 microseconds. We're usually reading about 20 to 40 products per request, so these numbers are more realistic than you might guess. Because Memory Store is managed Redis, it was easy to find clients that support all the features that we need for performance, such as pipelining. We need to avoid the calls to Data Store, which means we need to have a long TTL on our cache. But Alexa already told us the products are constantly changing. They're going in and out of stock, prices are changing, images are changing, so we can have a long TTL. Our product ingest pipeline writes to Data Store, as it always has. But now, it's also notifying us of invalidation by pushing product IDs onto Google Cloud PubSub. We have a listener that reads those IDs from PubSub, pulls the products from Data Store, and writes them to our cache. You may be wondering, why do we send IDs instead of just sending the product bodies? Well, the product ingest is concurrent, so we can't know if any single update is authoritative. By sending IDs instead of bodies on PubSub, we can guarantee that the cache is eventually consistent, rather than being potentially inconsistent forever. And we can have a very long TTL. Data Store natively returns protobufs, and those come out to about two kilobytes on average. Now, we could have come up with a new serialization format that does everything that Data Store's native serialization format does, but there was really no reason to do that because it's already doing it. But with about two kilobytes per product and many, many products, we'd end up with a huge cache, which is both expensive and slow. So how do we mitigate that? The first thing is that we don't update products that aren't already in the cache. Products get into the cache by being used in a marketing product, which means that the only objects that will be in the cache are the objects that are actually being sent out. So if a partner of ours happens to have a catalog of a million products, but they're only sending out emails with a thousand of those products, we only have to have a thousand in our cache. The second thing we looked into was compression. But compressing small items is hard. Most compression algorithms learn as they go, which means if you're compressing a book, the first page is going to compress significantly worse than the 10th page or the 100th page. And with only two kilobytes, there really isn't a lot of time to learn. By the time you get to the end of the product and finally know how to compress it, there's no more to compress. So what did we do? Well, first thing is that we downloaded 1,858 products from Data Store for one of our partners, which came out to about 32 megabytes. And we then tried to compress them using gzip and xz. And uh, while the LZMA compression of XZ is really too slow for runtime, that's kind of okay because uh, we're really just testing here. So we then found that we were unable to do better than two to one compression, even with a very slow XZ. Well, that's not really good enough. So how good could it be? Well, we took those same 1,858 products and we tarred them all together effectively making one big book, and compressed again. And we found that gzip was able to do better than 5 to 1, and xz was even able to do better than 8 to 1. But we can't just tar these products at runtime. That doesn't make any sense, because we don't need all the products, and we don't know which ones we need. So we needed something else. Fortunately for us, Z standard exists, which allows you to train its compression ahead of time. They call this dictionary compression, and that's exactly what we do. On a per-partner basis, we download a sample of the products, compress them, training the dictionary, and then we store those dictionaries into data store, caching them in the service as well. So anytime we read or write a product, we know exactly what dictionary to use, and the compression is fantastic. 
as you can see here, Z standard with dictionary is better than five to one, even on small two kilobyte core bus. There are other high performance and decompression algorithms, such as Snappy and LZ4. However, those don't offer dictionary compression, which as we've seen is a big factor with such small bodies. As a reminder, this is where we were before, and this is where we are now. We have products still stored in data store as we always have, but now they're being kept up to date in a cache with our product update listener, which is receiving invalidation messages over Google Cloud Pub Sub. The recommendation service itself has a small LRU cache with a short TTL just to keep the traffic to memory store down to a dull roar. And we think we're finally as powerful as necessary. But how to be sure? The only way is to test it. And fortunately for us, through the power of GKE, this was pretty straightforward. We were able to deploy our service and the attacking client into Google Kubernetes engine. And we could then scale both the service and that client with a single command. The entire run, including rescaling the components, was completely scripted and hands-off. And how did we do? Well, we did pretty well. With 16 two-core pods running the service, we were able to pull between 56 and 60 kilohertz while still staying within our latency budget. And we hit our target of 20 kilohertz with just four pods. Yes, we are finally as powerful as necessary. Now that this code is out in production, well, you know, changes need to be made and we need to live with it. One thing that we do a lot is when changes are made, we'll deploy a canary into Kubernetes. That allows us to validate that the new code doesn't have a regression in terms of correctness or performance. And then once that's proven, we can scale it up to the rest of our pods. Logs are exported automatically from GKE into BigQuery. And so we've got a one-stop shop for when we need to look and see what happened. And we're exporting all of our metrics to Datadog. And because this is a production service, We've got pager duty to wake us up in the middle of the night if something catastrophic should happen. So what have we got? Well, recommendations are being written to BigQuery and Google Cloud Storage, as they always have been, but now they're being copied into Google Cloud Bigtable. Products are stored in data store, again, as they always were, but are now being cached in memory store and kept up to date using invalidation triggered through Google Cloud PubSub. Our clients hit us using either protobuf over HTTP 1.1 or gRPC over HTTP 2. And the whole thing is deployed into Google Kubernetes Engine. I'd like to thank you all for listening. And thank you to Google for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today.